Quick revision video on haloalkanes. We start with the essentials. They contain at least one halogen atom. They can be primary, secondary or tertiary, and that's all about the number of carbon atoms bonded directly to the carbon-halogen carbon. Carbon-halogen -halogen. carbon bonds are polar due to the higher electronegativity of the halogen atoms compared to carbon. So the carbon will be slightly positive, delta plus, and the halogen would be delta negative. Haloalkanes will therefore react with nucleophiles, electron pair donors, and they undergo nucleophilic substitution reactions. So an example of that is they react with water slowly, or with aqueous hydroxide ions more quickly to make alcohols, and that's known as hydrolysis. And the equations for those reactions you can see on the screen now. So Rx just represents the haloalkane and ROH is the alcohol. HX would be a hydrogen halide and NAX would be a sodium halide. So we'll look more closely now at the nucleophilic substitution mechanism. So the example I'm using is chlorocyclohexane with sodium hydroxide. So there's the overall equation. So you can see the Cl has been substituted for the OH. But when we look at the mechanism, we're only interested in the OH minus I on the nucleophile. So the first thing we do is put a dipole across the carbon halogen bond. And so because OH minus ions are nucleophiles, they will donate a pair of electrons to that slightly positive carbon. And that's going to repel the pair of electrons in the carbon halogen bond completely onto the halogen and break the bond by heterolytic fission and that's going to produce the products. So we've got cyclohexanol and a chloride ion. So we'll look at how to compare the rates of hydrolysis of haloalkanes now. So there's the general equation again, and you can see I've separated out the H plus ion from the X minus ion in the hydrogen halide, because that's going to be produced over time, and we can use silver nitrate in the reaction mixture to detect the presence of the halide ion obviously it's going to produce a silver halide precipitate. So the procedure, you take haloalkanes with the same chain length, just to keep it fair, the comparison. In a test tube, you would add ethanol and the haloalkane. Ethanol is just acting as a solvent. It enables the reactants to mix more efficiently. In a different test tube, you put silver nitrate solution in, and you'd put them both in a water bath at around 50 degrees C. You give them a few minutes to reach the same temperature and then you'd mix the contents of the two test tubes so the reaction's going to start. And you measure the time for the precipitate to form. You'd repeat the procedure using exactly the same volumes for your other haloalkanes and then you'd measure the rate as one over the time. The rate's determined by the strength of the carbon-halogen bond, so we would typically compare um, chloroalkanes with bromo and iodoalkanes. So the carbon-chlorine bond has got the highest bond enthalpy, it's the strongest bond of those three, and so it has the lowest rate. And the CI bond has the lowest bond enthalpy, or it's the weakest bond, gives the highest rate. So we'll just finish with haloalkanes and the environment. So typical properties of haloalkanes are volatile, so low boiling point, they're not flammable, they are unreactive and non-toxic. So typically they've been used in the past as solvents, flame retardants, so in fire extinguishers, aerosol propellants and refrigerants. And it was found sort of back in the 70s that they were um, contributing to ozone depletion in the stratosphere. And so to combat this, a lot of countries um, signed up to what's called the Montreal Protocol, where they agreed to basically ban them, so stop using them. And luckily that's helped recover the ozone levels, but there's still concerns because haloalkanes are in the environment due to their unreactivity. They've got long residence time, it's called, and not all countries signed up to the protocol. So obviously some countries are still using these things. So what's going on in the stratosphere is the CFC, so I've used dichlorodifluoromethane to illustrate this. The UV 
is breaking the um, CCL bond by homolytic fission and we're producing these two radicals. The chlorine radical starts to attack ozone and it produces O2 and a ClO radical. That ClO radical combines with an oxygen atom and forms another oxygen molecule and reforms the chlorine radical. So overall, if you add these two steps together, you get the overall equation where ozone is combining with an oxygen atom and producing two oxygen molecules. So in other words, ozone has been broken down irreversibly. It's worth noting as well that the chlorine radical is actually acting as a catalyst in this process because it's reformed at the end and it can just continue to attack more and more ozone molecules.